hundreds of dramatic behind-the-scenes adventures are all part of the Clyde Beatty story. Here is the story called Canine Courage. Loyal, trusting, devoted. Those words have been used for centuries to describe man's best friend, his dog. My first dog was just a homeless stray I adopted when I was a kid in Chillicothe, Ohio. Since that time, I've had many dogs, some pedigreed, some mongrel, and I loved every one of them. I'd like to tell you a story about one dog in particular, though, a dog whose courage once saved my life. He was just a raw-boned pup of six months when Harriet and I first saw him at the kennels of a friend who lived near our winter quarters. I had no idea you had so many dogs, Mr. Randolph. We've expanded since we were here last year. Yeah, we certainly have, Harriet. Oh, I've always liked the look of those police dogs. Maybe... Honey, please. Mm-hmm. You're talking to a breeder now. They're German shepherds. <laughs> well, I won't hold it against the client. German shepherds, police dogs. What's the difference? They're so alert, so intelligent. <laughs> They're that and more, Harriet. They're everything a man could want in a dog. Of course, I'm prejudiced, I guess. That husky fellow over there. Boy, he's a beauty. He doesn't seem as frisky as the others, though. Is he ill? Oh, no, no. He's as healthy as can be. Just has a different temperament. Those eyes. He acts as if he can see right through me. What's his name, Randy? Well, I make it a practice not to name the pups Clyde. I've uh, found when people buy a dog, they like to name it themselves. He looks exactly like that full-grown male in the next pen. Well, he should. That's his sire. His name is Major. A perfect example of the old expression, like father, like son. Yeah? That pup hasn't taken his eyes off you, Clyde. I can hardly take mine off him either, so we're even. Oh, he's a special one, all right. In my opinion, he's the finest specimen I've seen in several litters. Well, they all look good, but, but this one... Randy, I've got to have that pup. Name your price. Uh, uh, sorry, Clyde. I've decided not to sell him. But you told us in the house that all these pups out here are for sale. They were, then. Then? Well, what since you... seeing how you agree with my opinion of this particular pup, I've decided not to sell him, Clyde. Well, let's... No, pup. I've got a better idea. I'm going to give him to you. What? How <laughs> wonderful, Mr. Randolph. So you're not kidding me, are you? <laughs> oh, no, I wouldn't kid about something like this. You see, Clyde, I've got a hunch this dog is made to order for you. So, he's yours. We return to Clyde Beatty in just a moment. And now, back to Clyde Beatty's story, Canine Courage. Good boy, Colonel. Now, down. That's it. Stay. It's amazing, Clyde. He seems to understand everything you say. Sure he does. We speak the same language. Okay, boy, school's out. Come here. Come on. Come on. Ah, oh, that's my boy. Good fellow. Hey! <laughs> Look at him. You know, I never dreamed what Mr. Randolph gave him to you three months ago. He learned things so quickly. He's done fine for a nine-month-old pup. I wanted to teach him a few things before we leave winter quarters and hit the road, though. We won't have much time then. Hmm. I wonder how he'll like the circus routine, being on the go all the time. Don't worry. He'll be a trooper. <laughs> you don't like that dog much, do you, Clyde? <laughs> I'd rather fight with my right arm, honey. I'd be jealous if I didn't feel the same way about him. Oh, by the way, when are you going to take him out to the ground? Shouldn't he be getting used to the circus animals? Yeah, I guess so. Somehow I just haven't gotten around to it. Doesn't seem possible we open in a week. The winter slipped by awfully fast. Mm. This evening slipped by in a hurry, too. It's almost midnight. Oh, we'd better turn in, dear. We both have a busy day tomorrow. Right. I've got to run my lions and tigers through a dress rehearsal, for one thing. Hey, Colonel, want to go with me tomorrow and meet some of my other little pets? <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's a deal. <laughs> Colonel, back here. Heel. Those are the elephants, boy. What do you think of them? Hmm? Morning, Mr. Beatty. Hey, is that the pooch you've been raving about? Sure is, Hank. This is Colonel. Colonel, meet Hank. Hi there, fella. Hi there, boy. Hi there. Boy, he's a dandy, ain't he? Best in the West, Hank. I thought I'd better bring him out so he can start getting used to the animals. Well, judging from the way that tail's going, he seems to like the elephants anyway. Sure. How are my lions and tigers today? Fat and sassy. The vet's over taking a look at that scratch on Pasha's neck now. Good. Let's walk on over there, huh? Sure thing. Poor old Pasha. 
I thought for a minute Sultan would kill him before I could break him up the other day. Yeah, there was some fight. Doc's been taking good care of Pasha. He'll be all right. That's good. Sultan's been causing trouble ever since I brought in that new female Sheba. Yeah, I noticed. He's jealous. <laughs> What's the matter, boy? Hey, look at the hair on his back. It's standing up like a porcupine. It's okay, Colonel. He smells the cat. Funny what instinct will do, isn't it? You've never seen a lion or a tiger before, but look at it. Let's go to the barn here, Mr. Baby. Okay, boy. Come on. Colonel. Colonel, come on. Come on, boy. It's okay. He's shaking, Mr. Beatty. He's nervous. Colonel, come here. I haven't got all day. No you. He won't budge. That's funny. I... Oh, he'll get used to the lions and tigers in time, Mr. Beatty. I wonder. After all, he's still a pup. I know. He's never acted this way before, but the worst thing I could do would be to force him to go in. Yeah. Stay there with him and keep an eye on him, Hank. I got to go in and talk to Doc a minute. Sure, I'll watch him. And don't worry. After Colonel's around for a while, he'll be all right. <laughs> over the map. We've covered a lot of territory this season. I know. And I'm forced to admit I'm tired. Well, we'll be finished and back at winter quarters in a week, honey. I guess we can both do with some rest. I intend to sleep for a week the minute our tour ends. <laughs> Wake me up in two weeks, will you? Oh, no. That wouldn't leave anyone to feed Colonel, remember? Foiled again. <laughs> you big lug, Colonel. You see what sacrifices I have to make for you? <laughs> Maybe he'll want to sleep a few days, too. The way he shadowed you, he should be as tired as we are. Yeah. I still can't understand it, though. Understand what? The colonel's attitude toward the lions and tigers. He's the only dog I've ever had that drew the line when it came to getting close to the big cat. Oh, I don't think that's so hard to understand, Clyde. After all, Mr. Randolph warned you a year ago that Colonel had a different temperament than other pups we saw. Maybe he's just decided to ignore them. Evidently, that's it. At any rate, he still won't get within 50 feet of one of the cages. So all he does is stand there growling with a the hair on his back bristling. Well, there's no real reason for him to go near the cats anyway. So what difference does it make? Well, no difference really, I guess. It just seems funny that none of the other animals bother him in the least, and yet he's scared oh, of the... Oh, Clyde, he's not scared of them. Look, honey, I don't hold it against him. He's still the best dog I ever saw, but there's no use kidding ourselves. He is scared of them. I don't believe it. Well... Let's forget the whole thing. It doesn't really matter one way or the other. Our tour finished, we returned to the same winter quarters in California and settled down to the usual routine. Three months rolled by awfully fast, and I became busy once again getting things organized for our next tour. Colonel was fully grown now and my constant companion. In my office at winter quarters, he would lie right beside my desk while I took care of the problems that always come up with a circuit. Down, Colonel, down. Come in. Can I see you a minute, Mr. B? Sure, Hank, come on in. What's on your mind? Well, it's that new guy, Abbott. The one we hired last week. Oh, the cage boy. What about him? I think we made a mistake about him. I don't think he's worth half what he's being paid. Wait a minute, what do you mean, we made a mistake? I only hired him on your recommendation, Hank. Yeah, I know, but... Well, I made a mistake then. I needed another man, and this fellow come around, said he'd work for Johnson Brothers Circus and all that. Well, what's the matter with him? He just doesn't do anything right. And half what I tell him to do, he doesn't do at all. Hmm. You think we ought to get rid of him? Well, I don't like to cause a man to lose a job, but in this case, I think it'd be best if you canned him. Well, I haven't got time to speak to him this morning. I'll tell you what, I'll come over to the cat barn this afternoon and have a little talk with him, okay? Okay, Mr. Beatty. I've got an appointment right after lunch with an agent. As soon as I finish with him, I'll be there. Kidding, Clyde. These boys are the best tramp act I've handled in years. They're sensational. That may be, Jenkins, but I repeat, I've got two good trampoline acts now, and I can't use another one. Okay, okay. Let's see now. Um, how are you fixed the wire walkers? Got a first-class slide for life act? Sorry, got one of those, too. Don't you have anything new and different? 
Clyde boy, let's face it. There's nothing in the way of a circus act that hasn't been done. Nonsense. People were saying that before electricity was discovered. And then they saw the light. <laughs> oh. Mm. I knew you'd come out with at least one corny pun before you left here. I'm sorry, Clyde. Just couldn't resist it. Well, Colonel, what's the matter, boy? What's got into him in here? I don't know. It's a baby! It's a baby! It sounds like Hank. It's a baby! Well, what is it, Hank? What's the matter? It's Queenie! She's loose at the cat barn. What? Oh, brother. Queenie, who's this? One of our leopards is loose. Come on, Hank. If that spotted devil gets out of the barn, she'll kill anything that moves. Clyde Beatty will return in just a moment. But first... And now, back to Clyde Beatty and Canine Courage. Clyde was in his office at winter quarters when Hank, the head cage boy, burst in with the news that one of the leopards was loose in the camp barn. Quickly, they raced toward the big barn, knowing that if the leopard got out, someone might be killed. Must have been that darn fool Abbott. He cleaned out Queenie's cage while she was in the exercise arena. Must have left the cage door open. I'm just glad you were around to shut the barn door and keep her in there, Hank. Yeah. Hey, what about that window on the east side? Is it shut? I checked that. It's shut. Hey, Colonel sees where we're going. He stopped. Never mind the dog. Let's get that cat back in her cage. Yeah. How you plan to do it? I'll have to go in and drive her back. Here's one of your chairs by the door. Yeah, I'll need it. How about the whips and blank on? They're all inside on the shelf. I'll find them, all right. You open the door and let me slip inside. But close it behind me quickly, you understand? Right, boss. You ready? Open up. I stood still as the door slammed shut behind me, waiting for my eyes to become accustomed to the dim light inside the barn. I could see no sign of Queenie the Big Leopard and knew she was crouched behind something hiding. At last, I could see fairly well and moved over to the shelf along the wall. From the shelf, I took a blank gun... And then, holding the kitchen chair in my left hand, I started the grim game of hide-and-seek. Can you see her, Mr. Beatty? Not yet, Hank. You'll probably know it when I locate her. Queenie's cage door was open. My problem was to find her and force her to go back into that cage. Cautiously, I edged forward, looking behind feed bins, under a couple of circus wagons. I could see better now. As I approached the window on the east side... And then I heard Queenie snarl and whirled in my tracks. I saw her crouch to spring from the top of an unused cage to my left. Queenie! Queenie, get back! I fired two blanks, hoping to scare her off. Instead, she sprang toward me. And as I stepped back to avoid her leap, my foot caught on something I hadn't seen. I tripped. In a flash, she was on me. Back! It's a baby! I looked up at the window just as a black shade purple through the glass. It was Colonel, and he wasted no time in attacking the spotted cat that was trying to kill me. In a flash, he was on her, splashing at her with his long fangs. Queenie now turned her attention to Colonel, and I was able to scramble to my feet. Colonel! Colonel, get away before she kills you! I knew Colonel was no match for Queenie. She'd written to shreds. Then my eyes fell on the object over which I had tripped. It was a short length of two-by-four. I brought the heavy piece of wood crashing down on Queenie's skull. Knocking her senseless. Colonel. Colonel, boy. Hank. Hank, come in here. Mr. Beatty. Mr. Beatty, what happened? I'll tell you later. Drag Queenie over to her cage and get her inside. Make sure that cage door's shut. Yes, sir. Hurry it up, Hank. Then run get Doc Forbes on the double. He's not here today, Mr. Beatty. No, oh, that's great. Well, get Doc Adams in. Doc Adams? He ain't no vet. I don't care. He's a doctor. Now, hurry it up. I'll carry Colonel over to my office. Bring him there. Yes, sir. Poor fella, Colonel. Well, what is it, Clyde? Who's sick? Colonel, he's in bad shape, Doc. You gotta do something. But your dog, why, see here, Clyde, I... <laughs> I know, I know, you're no vet, but get to work anyway. Well, from the looks of that arm, I'd say you're the one that I'd better start on. You'll start on Colonel. Brother, you'd better give him the best that's in you. Uh, yes, Clyde. Now, steady, boy, let's have a look here. Mm. Mm. Uh, Clyde. Yeah, Doc? Clyde, I know how you feel about this dog, but... I'm afraid he's beyond help. No, no, now I'm look. I'm sorry, Clyde. The best thing you could do would be to have someone put him away, out of his misery. No, don't you realize he saved my life? You've got to save his, Doc. Well, I'll try, Clyde, but I can't promise anything. I know it, but you've got to try. Do everything you can. 
I tell you, he's got to live. He told me. Everything will be all right, honey. Hank said Doc Adams was taking care of him. Yeah, he's in the office working on him now. I couldn't take it, so I stepped out here. Oh, you poor darling. Clyde, your arm. No, oh, it'll be all right. Just scratch. Me. I've seen how a leopard scratches before, Clyde, baby. You should have that attended to at once. I'm next in line, honey. Just as soon as Doc finishes with Colonel, I'll have it taken care of. Oh, you fool. You wonderful fool. I guess you meant what you said over a year ago, didn't you? Huh? Oh, nothing. Oh, who's this coming with Hank? Well, it's Abbott, the guy who's responsible for this whole thing. Mr. Beatty. Mr. Beatty, I... I didn't mean to leave that cage door open, Mr. Beatty. I, I just wasn't thinking it. Abbott, if I would... Oh, what's the use? I know you didn't do it on purpose. I... I just forgot. I... I don't want to talk about it now. Yes, sir. And, and it won't happen again, Mr. Beatty. Well, I hope not. I'm lucky to be alive. What about my job? You aren't firing me, are you? Can't you understand? I don't want to go in. Abbott, a... if I were you, I'd be thankful Mr. Beatty's still here and not be worrying about a job. Well, j- that's the way it is. Okay, I, I didn't mean to cause no trouble. I just can't... The nerve of that bum. Says he's sorry and expects that to fix everything. No, no, Hank, we all make mistakes. Not the kind he made, honey. If he's worked around cats as he says he has, he should know better. And I gotta hand it to you, Mr. Beatty. I think if I'd have been in your shoes, I'd have busted him one right in the nose. Don't think it didn't occur to me, Hank. Now, that's a fine way for a pair of grown-up men to talk. What would that prove? You're right, honey. For now. For now? What do you mean? I mean that if Colonel doesn't pull through this, I just hope for Abbott's sake our paths never cross again. Colonel's going to be all right. Sure. <laughs> and I'm the guy that thought he was scared of those cats, remember? I remember. Honey, I think you knew better even then. Honey, I... I wish you could have seen the way he came diving right through that window. The, the way he dove at Queenie without a moment's hesitation. Doc. Doc, how is he? Well, Clyde, unless I'm badly mistaken, he's going to make it now. Clyde, did you hear that? I'll say I did, and I never heard anything sound better. Gee, that's well. Well, that dog is two-thirds hot. He was as game in there while I worked on him as when he was fighting that leopard. Oh, Doc, thanks. No, no thanks necessary, Clyde. You know, it's a strange thing. You've heard doctors speak of that spark within humans that often means the difference between life and death, what we call the will to live. Sure. Well, Colonel's got more than just a spark. With him, it's a regular torch. I could almost feel him fighting to live. And it's that courage, as much as anything I did, that made the difference. Is it okay if I have a look at him? Of course. For just a moment, though, I've got a job to do on you now, remember? He's forgotten, Doc. Well, I haven't. And if I don't tend to that arm soon, you might be a very sorry man. Yeah, okay, Doc. I just reminded Clyde a few minutes ago that he must have meant what he said a year ago. You didn't tell me what it was, though. I I said lots of things over a year ago. Well, I was referring to one thing in particular. We were sitting in the living room one night, three months after you got Colonel. And you were playing with him, and I laughed and said, you don't like that dog very much, do you, Clyde? And then you said... Honey, I'd rather part with my right arm. Well, that's a fine sentiment, Clyde, but please, let me take care of it before you have to prove it. (laughs) (laughs) And now, here is the star of our show, Clyde Beatty. I'm sure many of you know what it's like to have a loyal dog. And I was thankful that Colonel's will to live was as great as his courage. There'll be another exciting story to tell you the next time we meet. stories are based upon incidents in the career of the world-famous Clyde Beatty and the Clyde Beatty Circus. The Clyde Beatty Show is produced and transcribed by Shirley Thomas, written by Robert T. Smith and Frank Hart Pelsey. Music composed and conducted by Albert Glasser. All names used were fictional, and any resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is a Commodore production.